How's everybody doing? Enjoying the summit so far? Cool. It's about to get better. Uh, we're here to talk about OpenStack control planes and uh, how we can make them a little bit more resilient and self-healing with uh, Kubernetes. So uh, before we go into the intro, I just want to say that we're all co we're all old co-workers that we uh, and friends in the container community, um, and we decided to come together to work on a proof of concept uh, in our spare time to help solve a like, common community problem, um, which is can we make a self-healing control plane? Uh, that being said, uh, I'm Derek Chamorro. I'm a cloud security architect at eBay, where we try to containerize everything we deploy. Um, there's my Twitter. Uh, I blog uh, primarily about lab stuff and a lot of virtualization. Uh, I've been an open stacker since the Folsom release, and uh, for those who know me, I'm a container and Kubernetes nerd. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of a startup company called uh, Cloud Perception in RTP, North Carolina. Uh, we provide application-centric solution through analysis and uh, interpretation of sensory information with uh, uh, actionable outcome. We're also the organizers of a Triangle Kubernetes Meetup. As of today, we have over 120 people join us. We also have a great help from uh, OpenShift team and also Atomic team from uh, Red Hat and other local community uh, from the different region, such as the uh, uh, Charlotte Container Orchestration Meetup and also New York City Kubernetes Meetup. And I'm uh, Randy Tuttle. I'm a co-founder and CTO of uh, Cloud Perceptions. Um, I've been in uh, software development in the early part of my career, uh, switching over to um, you know systems and solution engineering regarding uh, capacity and uh, 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 high availability systems, uh, particularly around service provider uh, VoIP and service provider video systems. Uh, I've been playing around with OpenStack since Folsom, and also along with Shishan, I'm also a uh, co-founder uh, of the Triangle Kubernetes uh, Meetup Group. So, um, moving to our agenda, we've basically broken this into three parts, um, conveniently so we can all speak. Uh, the first part basically sets a bit of context about why we're doing what we're doing. The second part is going to talk a bit about uh, the approaches we took. And finally, the third part will be the demo uh, and uh, is uh, of what we actually did. And then we'll wrap up with a bit of a summary and then some time for Q&A at the, at the end. So uh, what is our vision? Uh, what, do we, what do we think um, would be the perfect environment for an OpenStack control plane? Well, first of all, we believe it should be easily deployed. So with minimal steps, we can have a functional OpenStack environment, spending fewer man hours and requiring minimal expertise, especially around configuration and troubleshooting. We'd like for it to be consistent and repeatable. So any deployment should be repeatable and easily replicated across organizations with consistent outcomes. Uh, we feel that with consistent outcomes, um, uh, we can spend less time troubleshooting those deployments. We'd really like for it to be quickly operationalized. So with OpenStack deployments, we need to overlay operation stacks to effectively monitor those deployments. Um, this takes a lot of engineering skills. Um, but, you know, ideally we could have a fully functioning uh, stack in five to ten minutes. I mean, that'd be perfect, um, including the ability to monitor and uh, do st uh, straightforward in-service upgrades. Um, you know, it should be easily and quickly, you know, we should be able to drop in some value-added value uh, features. Uh, it should be simple to scale. We want to be able to do some hands-off. You don't want to touch it. We want to extend, have it expand. Uh, to a maximum scale to meet demand and then retract when, um, when, that's, when that demand has subsided back to a guaranteed scale level. Uh, surely it should be able to sail hill upon a failure. In other words, we want our primary focus be, to be on maximizing availability, and secondarily, we'll address what the cause of the failure was. So then with more uptime and confirmation that the service is performing at the level expected, we expect that we would see improved SLAs. So for today's focus, though, we're going to focus on these main areas. Can you help me advance these to four, just go to five? So uh, what are some of the OpenStack pain points that we sort of deal with? Um, well, uh, around deployment, we want it fast. Uh, when we talk about fast, it's usually synonymous with automation. And furthermore, I think most people would agree that automation is table stakes in DevOps. Um, some automation tools are currently available, such as Ansible, Chef, Puppet, et cetera. 
And these have really emerged to aid in speed deployment, um, some of which um, a few OpenStack projects actually utilize. But these have an the appearance of being somewhat adjunct to the core of OpenStack and still are time consuming to utilize. Um, despite improvements in OpenStack documentation, they're still targeted more to a generalized deployment approach uh, with indications of what knobs and things to tweak to, to add flexibility. So while OpenStack is quite fe flexible, this is flexibility that organizations sometimes struggle with to overcome uh, when adapting to their, their own deployment architectures. And so companies are sort of left with this do-it-yourself approach uh, or even turning to many of the turnkey solutions that are out there. And of course, all of them require their own skill sets. So then we run into these inconsistencies between our build and deployment, or development, uh, deployment environments. Um, what worked uh, last week doesn't work this week for some reason. You know, the differing dependencies between development, staging, production environments can lead to breakages all along the, the, the points along the way. And we could argue that some of this is probably attributable to, you know, complicated organizational processes which tend to have many moving parts and many points of failure and great opportunities for miscommunications all the time. So, um, and then another, another area we see is uh, operation, oper 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 sorry, uh, uh, operalization, I have a hard time with that word. First off, um, what is the appropriate engineering? Typically our over, uh, systems are over-engineered for worst case demand which can result in a wasted or underutilized capacity. Um, we have the traditional monitoring tools, which are really not enough anymore. They sort of give us this reactive uh, rather than a proactive approach. So we need to bring in more advanced tooling to collect these metrics, uh, these use metrics. And what I mean by use, I mean utilization, saturation, and error rates. Uh, these kinds of metrics can help us better trigger failovers and adapt to scale demands. And then, of course, we want to have some level of upgrades. Um, you know, at some point, we're going to have to upgrade our application. And ideally, that operation um, should be uh, non-disruptive or have very minimal uh, downtime. Um, but when we bring in the advanced tooling, of course, um, it, uh, you know, it can uh, require specialized skill. So going back to our vision, uh, in terms of these three main points, um, we'd like for our solution to be easily deployed, quickly operationalized, consistent and repeatable across DevOps, and finally, self-heal, the primary focus on availability. Okay, so since the focus of this uh, presentation is around OpenStack control plane, we'd like to touch on a couple of those pain points we consider uh, problematic. So up front, we have uh, this investment in pre-deployment planning and engineering. Uh, first, we've got to depend, uh, determine the anticipated demand and sizing requirements prior to the instantiation of our control plane. This capacity and planning, uh, this capacity planning and skill testing is significant, and it, it requires a lot of upfront man hours, which can delay our time to market. Uh, systems tend to be uh, over-provisioned because no one really, really knows what the demand will be, so and that adds cost. And then we have this uh, inadequate post-deployment problem. Um, we can't really monitor uh, that well. So uh, again, touching on dev stop, uh, DevOps, uh, we know that DevOps organizations must utilize sound monitoring practices. These provide teams with solid feedback where uh, adjustments may be needed. As we said in our vision, the primary focus is on service availability. Um, failure causes are secondary. Nevertheless, the, the insufficient use metrics, the utilization, saturation, error rates, uh, makes it very difficult to uh, diagnose and trouble, uh, troubleshoot service failures. And then we also have the lack of these built-in API uh, health checks, specifically uh, application and, or ser service-centric health checking. And then we lack service, uh, service healing. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of systems don't really have these uh, built-in service healing capabilities. Uh, sometimes we have to just drop in uh, an overlay of automation uh, to, to achieve that. Again, self-healing self should be our end game. Uh, again, uh, with our focus on uh, service availability and the, the cause of the problem sort of be, being secondary to that. Then we have, uh, you know, lack of elasticity. So, as we mentioned earlier, the systems tend to be a little uh, over-provisioned. And so when we have to add additional capacity, expanding the system may result in more capacity than we really, really need it. 
and then we have to go, of course, stitch all that in. Um, the other side of that coin is, is that they, all this added capacity that we just added in, um, um, it's not really removed when it's no longer needed in a lot of cases. We just leave it stranded there and it's not really ever utilized. So by having some, some level of elasticity, we can spend less time up front with the engineering and planning and move more quickly to a service deployment and then we allow our auto scaling system to handle elasticity around uh, the predetermined, predetermined policies. So just quickly, we'll um, drill down on what really makes HA control plane and where do our problems manifest themselves. So with any HA control plane, we know that um, our goal is to eliminate a single point of failure. Um, so let's look over some of those elements and discuss uh, some of the previously mentioned pain points. So at the top, we sort of have our load balancing services. Uh, generally, when we add a service or expand it or contract it, we have to go in and you know, manipulate our, our load balancing service. And this can be sort of tedious, error prone, manual process, or maybe we have, we're lucky enough, we have some sort of overlay uh, orchestration to, to do that for us. But again, that still requires specialized skills to drop in. So we'd prefer it if our load balancing services could update uh, behind the scenes without us being uh, involved in it. So then we talk about, um, you know, what about uh, control plane failover? So all of our control plane components are HA, as we've noted, and a lot of the services in OpenStack, we sort of distribute those uh, across the various controller instances. So this works pretty, pretty good under optimal uh, conditions, but um, so if we're near or at our engineered levels or a single fault occurs, then we've got, we might have some problems and we'll lose, you know, all those services kind of get lost on that one node, for example, because we tend to bunch all those redundant services over on that one controller. And so we're sort of in a weird air condition where we've got services sort of some level of outage going on. So what we'd really like is some sort of self-healing control plane that we could know with confidence the service would function at maximum availability regardless of any failures that may have occurred. And so what about upgrades? Um, this is some of the same characteristics of, an, of a failure, but in a bit of a more controlled fashion. In other words, we can plan for it. So nevertheless, you know, upgrades tend still to be disruptive, which, which can make the HA service partially unavailable. So you can work around these to avoid these disruptions, but again, you know, we have to put temporary measures in place, and that requires, again, additional man hours to do all that. Um, so it'd be better if we could just sort of selectively pick um, uh, what services get upgraded and when we want to do it. So then, again, just touching a bit on the topic of scaling, uh, when we build out our control plan, we sort of take, again, our best guess estimate. And eventually, or maybe we might even use some empirical data that we have handy that can help us predict what the, the anticipated land, uh, demand might be. So while that's imperfect, it can lead to over or unengineered systems. Um, this can then manifest in poor user experience, for example, high latencies or because you're under, under engineered the system, or you might end up with some under uh, utilized capacity. So it becomes a real challenge to find the right balance and operationally it becomes onerous to make all these changes. So we prefer if our system could sort of scale up and down on demand uh, whenever it needed it and operate within a minimum max range and then uh, it would place the workloads where, when and where they were needed. And then finally, on the topic of service troubleshooting, you know, it's sort of difficult to isolate where instances, uh, all the instances while trying to maintain that maximum service uh, availability. So next, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Derek, who's going to talk a bit about Kubernetes uh, and why we believe the attributes of Kubernetes and the attributes of containers in general can accommodate many of our, our needs and, and help us with our pain points. Thanks, Randy. So before I go into our proposed solution, uh, I want to do a brief primer on Kubernetes, uh, some of the covering some of the core concepts as well as some of the uh, overall architecture that we've used. So first, Kubernetes, what is it? Um, well, it's an open source automation framework for deploying, managing, and scaling applications via Docker across a cluster of hosts. Um, it was started about over a decade ago as an internal container management system at Google. Uh, it was codenamed code Borg. Um, it evolved over time. Uh, infused with kind of like the lessons learned from a decade of their experience in managing applications and scaling them out. Uh, it was open sourced in 2014 and uh, its current version is 1.2. So what's the advantage? 
Well, first, it's declarative. Uh, it allows your applications to be deployed uh, quickly and predictably. Uh, Kubernetes works to monitor the current state of services and synchronizes it with the desired state as defined by you, the administrator. Well, what does that mean? That means that if an application container temporarily goes down and you declare that you need three copies of that application, uh, it's the responsibility of Kubernetes to start up another container. Scale. Uh, applications are scaled on demand instead of requiring resources to be allocated statically. The current version of Kubernetes can scale up to 1,000 nodes uh, and up to 30,000 containers per cluster. It's easy to build, it's easy to update. You can build a fully functional self-healing control plane that you'll see uh, in our demo later in as little as five minutes. You can seamlessly roll out new features to existing deployments without the need for added downtime. And it's efficient. So you're using the, only the resources you need, um, thus you avoid uh, over or under provisioning and increasing your average server utilization rate. So why does it benefit the OpenStack community? Well, it's what this talk is pretty much based on. It's self-healing. Uh, auto restart, auto scale, auto replication, uh, those are features that are needed now and not tomorrow. It's consistent. Uh, it's consistent with your build as well as your resources. You pragmatically and efficiently only use the resources you need on demand, as well as improved SLAs. Uh, Kubernetes comes with built-in API health checks, specifically application and service-centric health checks, as well as self-healing services that lead to greater uptime of services. And uh, that's always a good thing, right? So let's discuss the architecture a little bit more uh, in detail in the next slide. So the controlling unit within the Kubernetes cluster is called a master node. Uh, it serves as the main management contact point for administrators and it also provides many cluster-wide functions for its worker nodes. Um, and when I say cluster, a cluster is a set of compute, uh, storage, and network resources where applications are deployed. Some of the core components of the master node are etcd. Uh, etcd is a distributed key value store uh, for shared configuration and service discovery. etcd provides the ability to watch for changes and represents the state of a cluster uh, that each component can reference to configure or reconfigure themselves. We have an API server. The API server exposes a RESTful interface that uh, processes operations such as creating pods and services uh, and updating the corresponding objects in that CD. We have a scheduler, and what it does is it schedules things. The scheduler watches the API server for unscheduled pods and schedules them onto healthy nodes based off of resource requirements as well as tracks resource utilization on each node. And then we have a controller manager, uh, and it manages a few different controllers, primarily the endpoints controller, which manages service endpoints, and the replication controller, which manages the ability to scale pods across a fleet of machines uh, to ensure the desired number of pods are always running. Then we have a worker node. The worker node runs all the components necessary for running application containers and load balancing service endpoints. Uh, nodes are also responsible for reporting resource utilization and status information back to the API server. So the components of a worker node are as follows. We have a kubelet. Uh, the kubelet service communicates with a master node to receive commands. And these commands are received uh, is in a form of a manifest, which defines the workload to be performed. The uh, kubelet also is responsible, responsible for checking the uh, health of a service. We have Docker, which hopefully everybody in the audience is, uh, is aware of and familiar with. It's the container runtime engine. It runs on every node and handles downloading and running containers. Uh, Docker is controlled locally via its API by the kubelet. We have pods. Uh, pod is the basic unit that Kubernetes deals with. Uh, containers themselves are not assigned to hosts, but instead are grouped together as pods. Uh, a pod is generally represents one or more containers that should be controlled as a single application. And finally, we have kubeproxy. Uh, and it, kubeproxy is responsible for forwarding requests to the correct containers. It can do primitive load balancing and is generally responsible for making sure the networking environment is both predictable and accessible, but at the same time isolated. So how does this compare to our previous control plane architecture? If you look at the previous control, uh, HA architecture that we displayed before and then update it with the proposed architecture, we've replaced HA proxy instances with kubeproxy. Each service is built out separately and managed and monitored via Kubernetes. We achieve failover by having multiple copies of each service that we scale up or down based off of need. Load balancing that we found to be tedious to update with HA proxy is updated in unison with each service without the need to reconfigure manually or through a separate layer of automation. 
The architecture looks similar from a service perspective, but in the next slide, you'll see how we've built, scaled, and monitored our control plane with Kubernetes. So first, we build each OpenStack service, uh, in this case, Glance API, uh, from a corresponding Docker file, matching our defined standard. Uh, standard version, packages, volumes, and config. Containers are built as replicated services, grouped together as pods, and exposed via queue proxy as an OpenStack service port. Health check probes uh, will check the, uh, which are native to the build process and managed by the kubelet, are added to each pod configuration to perform pre-build readiness checks, as well as check the health of the pod post-build. In the instance of a service failure, and provided that you declared more than one replica in your OpenStack, in your build, then a copy is rebuilt, making the service, quote unquote, self-heal. And then we leverage Kubernetes built-in monitoring to detect service uh, disruption repair, as well as customizing our resource utilization. So why did we select Kubernetes over other uh, container, uh, automated container platforms? Well, from a provisioning and orchestration perspective, it's a complete automated container platform. With it, we can have a fully functional self-healed control plane as less, in as little as five minutes, thus spending less time on the installation and configuration and more time customizing it to fit our needs. Uh, it's easier to provision and orchestrate new applications uh, as pods can be started in seconds versus the minutes it takes a VM to, to instantiate. It also allows you to eliminate the need to worry about under or over provisioning, reducing the time needed for additional capacity planning. From a CI CD consistency standpoint, it's, it's easy to deploy and maintain applications. Um, Kubernetes leverages Docker as the build and deployment artifact, and you essentially gain a portable and shareable package in which a company can deploy their software to almost any infrastructure stack. So pretty much anyone who can build a Docker file can build a replicated service application in Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes also uh, provides fully integrated deployment options like rolling updates for version or <coughs> secu excuse me, security purposes, an example, uh, green brownfield deployments, and A-B testing. Uh, we also found upgrading to be no longer a disruptive procedure, but actually a productive one. Scaling. Uh, the benefit of the Cube service system is its ability to maintain connectivity to the underlying service aggregation, even when it's rescheduled to a different node, after failing or if the pod's IP address changes. The key benefit here is that there is no uh, reconfiguration required from a load balancer perspective. Um, Kubernetes does it for you. Uh, there's also significant cost reduction in increasing your average server utilization rate, therefore reducing your server footprint. A lot of environments uh, that run their VMs run them with a low utilization rate, sometimes as low as 10%, uh, while applications in a Kubernetes cluster can see a much higher utilization rate, sometimes as high as 70%. And it self-heals. Kubernetes has built-in self-healing mechanisms such as auto-restarting, rescheduling, and replicating containers. As a user, you define the state, and Kubernetes ensures that the state is met at all times in the cluster. Uh, we've all, hopefully, I, a lot of us have here have experienced a lot of issues troubleshooting open stack services, whether it's in the pre-build architecture or in a post-build service failure state. Uh, with the ability to ma uh, maintain service uptime, you replace the uh, what happened to my service with, with the well it corrected itself. Uh, and I'd also like to reiterate the point that service availability should always take priority to finding the cause of failure, not to ignore the cause, but uptime is king to maintaining any guarantees on your SLA. So you're all ready to see the demo? Uh, I'll hand it over to Sean. All right. Thank you, Derek. Um, today, so today's demo uh, have uh, three parts with uh, four video clips. Uh, it's going to last for about 10 minutes. Uh, in the first part, we're going to show you how easy and how fast you can use our proposed solution to, de to deploy your OpenStack Liberty Control Plan. Uh, since today's topic is self-healing, uh, we're going to uh, demonstrate the, uh, the self-healing capability of Kubernetes in part two. And we dedicate the last part for our friends in the operation team, during which we're going to showcase uh, how easy you can use to use Kubernetes building Elasticsearch engine and Kibana for the monitoring purpose. The entire demo system is built upon uh, three Ubuntu VMs. Uh, one of them act as the Kubernetes master and the worker nodes. Another two act as just the worker nodes. Uh, in this context, Kubernetes is going to orchestrate OpenStack Liberty release running inside a Docker container. Um, we also offer the live demo, but unfortunately, uh, it's not going to fit into uh, today's uh, 40 minutes time window. So if you are interested, uh, let me know offline, and I can run it for you.
All right. So in the first video clip, I start from a working system. I already have uh, existing pods. So here, in this case, I run a cleanup script to try to clean it up. Here I said, uh, just go grab a cup of coffee. Uh, it's actually a little bit exaggerating because by the time when your coffee is ready, the work is already done. Um, and then we can use a Kubernetes control command, uh, control get pod command, and verify the status of the system. And you can see that there's no pod exist, uh, exist uh, at this moment. And then as, a, as the next step, I kick off another script just to try to uh, deploy the OpenStack Liberty Control Plan. As you can imagine, it starts from our typical stuff like a MySQL database, uh, the RepMQ cluster. And this two step actually take a little bit longer. And followed by the, the Keystone, which is one of the most important component in the control plan. And then afterwards, as the, as the next step, as you can imagine, I start deploying other key, uh, core services, for example, Glance, Nova, and the Neutron. And as a last step, we actually deploy the Horizon dashboard. Uh, we also added the Neutron agent. Actually, we don't want a Neutron agent. We want to eventually come out with, with a solution to uh, replace it. I just added it here for fun. Um, it's still running. Um, but you, as you can imagine, uh, I actually fast forward a little bit because the entire deployment is going to take about five minutes, about five minutes. So by the end, I, I want to highlight two things. The first one is the cleanup process take about a one minute and uh, 18 seconds. And surely it also have a lot of room for us to improve. Um, but the, the deployment itself only take five minutes and one second. In the second video clip, we're going to start from where we left. And in, in this case, let's first take a look at the, the Kubernetes cluster. And here you can see for all of those OpenStack uh, key components, they are all running. And each of them have uh, three replicas. And thank the god of uh, the demo, they all uh, running fine. There's no restarts. And then I said, well, let's verify the OpenStack uh, control plan functionalities. Um, I kick off another script. Uh, as, as you can see, there's nothing fancy. I just go there, uh, check the, the, the Keystone uh, API, and you can see the list of services. And then the OpenStack Glance image is actually written, written nothing because it's a brand new system. And then afterwards, all of those the normal computers just come back fine. They're all up and running. And the uh, neutron agent, they all come back with a smiley face. And then I said, well, I need to entertain my, my audience. Um, so here, let's say, uh, just up to upload an image to the Glance image store. And you can see it's just running fine. It will come back. Um, and the uh, OpenStack image list command return this entry. At the next step, let's take a look at the self-healing capability of Kubernetes. Uh, this is one of the most exciting stuff. Uh, I write a Python script. It's, it's actually do nothing, just go to the a Glance API, constantly grab the, the list of image. And here, it return how fast the Glance image, uh, the Glance API can react to the API call together with HTTP error code or the return code. So let's keep this uh, Python script running. Uh, on the different terminal window, uh, we also, let's review the status of those pods. They're still running fine. I'll just pick up one of them. I use a Kubernetes delete pod command and just remove them. I remember at this moment that Python script is still running in the background, is doing its job. As you can tell, Kubernetes immediately figure out that pod is being terminated and in, 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 in parallel, it launched a new one. The new one is actually in the pending state. Um, in the Python script, it's actually report no outage. There's no outage. Uh, and the usually in operation, you can see, uh, is not about deletion. At a time we actually add a service back, it's caused more outage. So for, uh, for the extreme cautious reason, uh, let's take one more look of the pod. I want to wait until the pod is in the fully running stage, join back to the, uh, 
replication controller, and then by that time, let's verify the outage. Yeah, there's still no outage at this moment. So this demo give you some idea how fast Kubernetes can detect the termination of a pod and how fast it can bring up another one based on our predetermined, uh, pre-designed um, template. In the next one, I want to show you the Kubernetes dashboard. This is the native Kubernetes dashboard. Uh, as you can see, all of those OpenStack components we deployed in the previous steps, they all organize as a separate section. I label them as a dash RC, means a replication controller. Um, here, if you clip those v view detail, you can see the details of those uh, pods. Uh, in this case, Glance API, I have uh, three of them. The couple of things I want to highlight here. The first one is, as you can see, those pods, they actually consume a very little resources in, term of, in terms of the CPU utilizations and also the memory consumptions. The second thing I want to highlight here is, uh, as you can see, those pods, they also have their own unique IP address. They also spread across those three virtual machines with IP address 7.11, 7.12, and 7.13. And do you see that uh, the, the, the blue, the like, log icon? Uh, if you click it, you can see the log. Uh, this log entry is actually I generate uh, based on my Python script. It gives some ideas of how your service is running. If you see that added icon on the left, on the left panel, right? Uh, here, this is the place you can use to scale out or scale in your cluster. And surely we're, we're not gonna demo that today. I, I just uh, try to... Uh... All right, uh, so this is the Kubernetes dashboard. Uh, it's nothing fancy. And in the next step, I'm gonna show you the Kibana dashboard. Here, I, I laid out four charts. The first one um, is actually give you some ideas of how fast your Glance API is going to react to your HTTP call in terms of milliseconds. The next one show you just the traditional CPU utilizations. In this case, I actually timed it by 1,000 because the 0 0.001 is just kind of boring. Uh, the next one uh, give you some ideas of uh, the memory consumption in terms of in terms of megabytes. And the last one, that big green pie, that is just the HTTP return code. And in this case, you can see the all HTTP 200 OK is a good indication our system is healthy. So that concludes our demo uh, here today. Like I said, we will offer the live demo, uh, usually, uh, roughly around about 40, 40 minutes. Uh, if you are interested, let me know. I'll be more than happy to, uh, to run it for you. So here, um, based on our years of uh, experience, uh, we I witnessed a lot of issues in the OpenStack cloud, both public and private. And for so long, we have been trying to uh, uh, tackle them, mitigate them, or fully address them. But surely our efforts are not complete yet. And, and I hope today's demo convinced you uh, the order can be brought out of the chaos and your business can be successful with OpenStack Cloud if the right approach is taken to get closer to Nirvana. So let's take a look at uh, what we learned out of this uh, proof of concept. The first thing is we think, we firmly believe the OpenStack deployment can be very easy and fast. With the manual installation and the configurations, we we'll talk about days or even weeks of work followed by the months of chaos. Um, with the rise of automation tools like Ansible, uh, we can brought out to hours. As a matter of fact, we, we, we love Ansible. We have Ansible solution playbook, which can help with deploy um, OpenStack Liberty in about uh, 30, 40 minutes. But still, that not enough. Today, we demonstrate a way to, uh, to give you a fully automated approach and then give you a fully functional self-healed OpenStack control plan in five minutes. We would love to hand over to our friends in the uh, security team and also in the service team so you can spend less time on the installation and the configurations and more time to make sure your customer is happy or execute test suite to make sure your code is always in the deployable state. And throughout the entire course of CICD, we anticipate 
a small batch size of work flow through the, the dev team, QA team, and the oper operation team. So original thinking is significantly improve the product productivity by uh, creating an environment on demand, limiting the working progress, and also build a system which is very safe to change. But in reality, what we realized from our customers, that's not the case. Um, this great concept actually introduced a more delay due to the inconsistency between the dev environment, which is built and developed for the unit and function test, and then the staging environment driven by the QA team uh, for the, for the, uh, for, to, to find the corner cases and the test the business logic, and also the production environment. So given the, the nature of a container, uh, you can package your application with its dependencies, and we can create a virtual isolation on top of your physical box. Right? And don't forget Kubernetes as a very typical uh, orchestrator is also provide a lifecycle management uh, capability. So when a dev team need an uh, environment, we can bring it up in five minutes. When they don't need any more, we can shut it down in one minute. Has never been uh, so easy before. And with those tons of good news go to the dev team and also um, the service team and also the QA team, for our friends in the operation team, I have a bad news for you. With the introduction of those replicas, the, comp the complexity level of running uh, OpenStack is going to be timed at least by three. And also make the matters worse, uh, the name of the container and also the number of the container can be quite dynamic over the time. Uh, take those 10 plus deployment into the produ production every, uh, every day, actually. Uh, the, com the complexity level can be exponential. But don't feel frustrated because uh, we still firmly believe a solid operational solution is still achievable and we're actively working on it. Just in case we have any decision maker here uh, in our audience, uh, we, we can uh, summarize today's session with one word, uh, which is efficiency. By the end of the day, it's all about improving efficiency. So today we demonstrate an approach which we can apply the technology developed outside of OpenStack community and onto the OpenStack cloud itself. Uh, and the business value is quite clear. It can help you cut on the, the cost, for sure. Uh, and it also can help you increase the usability of your OpenStack services by a significant factor. And sure, this approach we took uh, require a lot of re rethinking. Um, now the question is, what are we going to do next? It's very simple. Just make it better. The top priority on our roadmap is scale. Today, this system is running fine uh, in the small scale environment. And tomorrow, we're going to go above and beyond um, by continuously integrating other open source tools. And eventually, it's going to become a great product for everybody. The so next one is the flexibility. Um, today, we actually hard code several parameters in our, in our code, including uh, user credentials, uh, due to the time constraint. But tomorrow, uh, we're going to make it more flexible so our customer will have more knobs to tweak uh, for your own design and the uh, use cases. The last one is reliability. Uh, today, we only share with you a subset of what we already developed. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to continue expanding our efforts so eventually the auto scaling decision can be, um, can be smarter and it can be more reliable given the richer set of metrics. But what's going to happen next, uh, I don't know. But I guarantee it must be something uh, more exciting. Um, I think we can uh, close for Q&A if you have any questions for our presentations. Sure. How extensive is the uh, quality of service uh, support within Kubernetes, uh, if any? Actually, Kubernetes have a couple of building uh, features, uh, give you some basic level of uh, quality of service, even performance measuring. Uh, for example, one of those metrics I display here on, a, on a Kibana is, a, is actually provided by Kubernetes by using Keepster. Um, but with that being said, like I said, it's very basic. Uh, we're still kind of exploring other alternatives 
for example, integration with Datadog. Um, those can give you a richer set of metrics, in, in our opinion. But that work has not been done so far yet. Um, I have two questions. So one is, where and how do you do like the initial seed, for example, of the database and um, registering the service endpoints? And the second question would be, what do you do with um, OpenStack services that are not horizontally scalable, like Cinder Volume? So, actually, we're at time. But it, if you want, we can just continue a little bit offline. Yeah. Per the quick answer to your question is we actually uh, develop, develop our own algorithm uh, to tackle those issues. Uh, very troublesome is the metric database and also uh, the reference 